Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pierre Laramie, the Executive Director of MEDIC, Medical Education Cooperation uh, with Cuba. Um, before uh, we begin, um, I'd like to uh, at least uh, mention the events that uh, took place a couple of days ago, um, events that uh, put first and foremost in our minds issues of, uh, of uh, terror and freedom and, uh, and safety. And uh, I want to uh, acknowledge the losses uh, in France and the preoccupation that we all share as we, as we sit together in this room. For nearly uh, 20 years, uh, our U.S. Non-pro nonprofit, 501c3, uh, has encouraged cooperation and built bridges between the U.S. and Cuban health communities. Uh, I would like to welcome and thank you for attending today's briefing to discuss why Cuban innovations matter to our health, to your health, um, and uh, the policy options to make these advances more accessible to Americans, as well as the barriers to accomplishing this. Before we begin, um, I wanted to thank Representative uh, Karen Bass and Representative Barbara Lee for their help in supporting this briefing and their leadership on health cooperation with Cuba. I'm so pleased to have such bipartisan representation of congressional staff today to talk about how we can improve Americans' health. Uh, we're in a new era in, in U.S. Uh, in U.S. Cuban relations. That's that's uh, indisputable, and uh, this briefing is about how we can shape that future. And we're honored to welcome this uh, bipartisan group to consider that future together. While we may not all agree with President Obama's decision to renew relations with Cuba, one thing is certain: our isolation from Cuba over decades means that most Americans are not benefiting from Cuban innovations in biotech and health strategies that could improve the health of people living in our country. The diplomatic opening offers the potential for greater health cooperation between the U.S. and Cuba, but there are significant barriers that need to be addressed. For example, why can't a U.S. lung cancer patient use a Cuban vaccine that would extend their life and quality of life? Why can't a U.S. diabetic patient at risk of losing a foot use a Cuban medication that would reduce that risk by 70 percent? While the Cuban health care system is not perfect, there, there is much to be gained by removing barriers and giving Americans access to what are really world-class advances from the Cuban biotech industry. Cuba also has some overall impressive health outcomes that many of us might be surprised to learn about. For example, with limited resources, Cuba has been able to lower its infant mortality rate to below our own in the U.S. And, and with fewer disparities. The U.S. spends over 10 times per capita what Cuba does on health care, yet the two countries have the same life expectancy. In addition, Cuba has the lowest HIV rate in the Americas, and the World Health Organization confirmed that it is the first country to eliminate mother-to-child transmission of HIV and syphilis. Finally, Cuba has among the world's highest doctor-to-patient ratio, and 62 percent of its physicians are women. How did Cuba achieve these successes in virtually every critical area of public health and medicine? Mostly by guaranteeing access to universal health care, creating a high-quality primary care and public health system that includes a neighborhood doctor who makes house calls, remember those? Educating a skilled health workforce, investing in a biomedical research infrastructure, and controlling infectious diseases. As a U.S.-based group, MEDIC brings together the, the health and medical communities of Cuba and our own country. And uh, this includes doctors and other medical practitioners, uh, of, uh, different types of scientists and uh, medical researchers, et cetera, to freely exchange experiences and, and learn from each other to benefit people in both our countries, especially the most uh, vulnerable. We organize community partnerships for health equity to improve health care and access in 11 communities around the country 
including South Los Angeles, Oakland, Albuquerque, Milwaukee, and the Bronx. Medic also helps American student graduates of Havana's Latin American Medical School, known as a LAM, to practice medicine in underserved communities here at home. ELAM has graduated nearly 25,000 doctors from over 100 developing countries. On full scholarship, the graduates include 200 young men and women from low-income and minority families in the United States. And the results thus far are proof of the graduates' commitment to providing care in underserved communities. Which brings me to our first speaker, herself, a U.S. graduate of the school, Dr. Tatiana Guerrero Pesano, class of 2010, now practicing at First Choice Community Health, a federally qualified health center in Albuquerque, New Mexico. She's going to give us a glimpse of why her life experience and her training in Cuba led her to the path she's chosen. Good afternoon and thank you. Uh, as the, as uh, Pierre mentioned, my name is Tatiana Guerrero Pezzano. Um, I go by Dr. Tatiana to many of my uh, patients. As this was the model, I was also given by my attending physicians in Cuba. Um, I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which as many of you may or may not know is the largest city in New Mexico, but is still quite resource poor and has a lot of very underserved areas when it comes to health care. Um, as sort of a, a, an urban center that attracts a lot of people from even more resource poor areas, um, there is a huge need, as there are in many other places of the state, for uh, primary health care services and that need outweighs the actual provision of those services. So um, as a primary care physician, I feel the burden of this. Um, um, before getting my medical education, uh, I was working actually in Santa Fe, New Mexico, with Family Health Care Center, where um, I was educating people about their diabetes, their asthma, their depression, and helping raise awareness in terms of the progression of their disease and the natural um, sort of course that their disease takes. Um, I realized quickly that this was paramount to getting patients to be medically compliant. Uh, with their medical treatment and to partner with their health care providers, whether they be um, primary care physicians or whether they be physician's assistants or certified nurse practitioners, or in the case of this um, family clinic in, in Santa Fe, uh, community health workers or promotoras de salud as well. So um, while I was there, uh, sort of simultaneously, I was participating in some things that happened um, between uh, some cultural alliances that were happening between U.S. cities and uh, Cuban cities. And I was able on a, or on a trip to uh, Havana, visit the medical school in Havana, the Latin American Medical School, or ELAM, um, where that sort of just deepened my desire to learn more about how I could be a part of the solution um, to these healthcare shortages that were all over New Mexico and, and indeed all over the United States. So the Latin American Medical School um, focuses on teaching primary care um, medicine to folks predominantly from areas that are medically underserved. Um, so all of my uh, classmates and fellow medical students were from Latin America, as the name would suggest. Um, however, we did have some uh, classmates as well from some African countries as well. Um, so we had this very rigorous training um, in medicine that not only was rigorous in the curriculum, but also in the um, bringing us together to learn a very culturally competent way of providing medicine to naturally resource poor and underserved areas. And the other 
part of that was that it was all in Spanish, which for me, thinking ahead and coming back to New Mexico, which has very large speaking, um, large uh, Spanish speaking communities, was going to be important for me in order to be able to uh, transmit the information and the, um, the education that I wanted to be giving my patients later on. So um, the Latin American Medical School, um, as Pierre was saying, has had about 200 or so uh, American students go through. Only three of us have been from New Mexico. 62% um, of these students end up going into um, medically underserved areas after they finish their residencies in primary care um, residency programs. Um, so I work at First Choice Community Health, which is a federally qualified healthcare center, and a couple of my classmates um, work in other federally qualified healthcare centers, including um, working for the prisons, um, working uh, as attending physicians with these family medicine residency programs, and then transmitting their information and their services that way including uh, working abroad and doing uh, global health abroad, which is also a skill that we learned from the healthcare um, and the medical curriculum in Cuba. Um, so the, the Cuban primary care system is based on two fundamental tenets, and these are prevention and education. Um, so as a trainee of this program, the emphasis was placed on making sure we used all of our senses in order to assess the patient before us. So there's a lot of emphasis placed on the physical exam and the history taking. And without that information, there's not much that we can do. This later on was going to be very important to me in how I practiced healthcare because I was going to be coming back to a resource poor area where while we may theoretically have the expensive labs and other studies available, a lot of the patients I serve can't necessarily afford this. So I do have to rely on those kind of basic skills of listening and partnering up with my uh, patients in order to do this. Um, this has benefited me tremendously since I've been back um, and since residency started, but even more uh, so after residency because I have a tremendous amount of diabetic patients who until they started receiving their health care with me were non-compliant. They just did not adhere well to their medical care. And a lot of that has to do with not understanding exactly what their disease was about, not understanding how the medicine helped them in their disease, not understanding their role in um, procuring their health care and, and their well-being. So I get teased a lot by my colleagues for spending a lot of time with my patients, but I find that in the long run it actually washes out and probably benefits everybody even more because I find that my patients understand and actually thank me. For the first time, a diabetic patient who's been diabetic for 10 years, never really understood why he was taking a certain medication. And after 15 minutes of sitting with me and kind of learning about that, I could feel his gratitude about just the information I was giving to him. So it was, it was extremely helpful. Yeah, perfect. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Tatiana, can you sit up here for, for a minute, see if there are any questions from the audience? So uh, ba ba based on, on what you learned uh, at, uh, at ELAM and uh, in, in your practice uh, since, you've, uh, since you've returned to the U.S., um, what, what uh, ideas would you be able to offer about how we could increase uh, the number of uh, physicians willing to uh, provide services in underserved areas? 
So uh, one of the main approaches of the primary care services that Cuba provides is a multi multidisciplinary care. So they have what they call these polyclinics, which is very similar to this new idea that's burgeoning here of the patient-centered medical home. Um, so they, they have it down to an art form where in these polyclinics you have your primary care providers as well as nurses, as well as physical therapists, as well as diabetes um, and other health educators. Um, so continuing along this road of this integrated multidisciplinary approach that in the Cuban poly center, polyclinics um, also actually incorporates non-Western forms of medicine, which I think is also uh, very helpful to our patients who don't necessarily have the resources available for Western forms of treatment and healing. Thank you. A anyone from the audience? Okay, thank you very much, Tatiana. Thank you.